All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dale Sprzansky. I'm the assistant editor of the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs. Uh, the Washington Report is co-hosting today's event with the Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy. Uh, we give all of you a warm welcome. Thanks for coming out early today and perhaps before the rain starts, so wise people. Um, so my job is just to do some housekeeping here so you all know what's going on today. Uh, the big thing important for the audience will be the question and answer session. So inside the bags you were given at registration are six note cards, one for each event. If you have any questions, you can write it on those note cards and pass it down to people who will be collecting them. They will give it to the audience members on the stage and answer your questions. This will allow us to speed things up, compile similar questions together, and keep our compact program flowing smoothly today. Um, this event is also being live streamed on our website, so questions can also be submitted on Twitter at Israel Lobby US. Uh, also, of course, just please make sure your phones are silenced if you're gonna be having conversations outside the doors so that events aren't disrupted. Um, book signing, lots of our authors will be uh, signing books later today throughout the day. The book signing schedule was found on the back of your program. Also, um, just a reminder that there are lots of members of the press here, so if anyone talks to you, it could end up published somewhere, so if you don't want something published, don't say it. Um, <laughs> um, if you'd like to rewatch something or um, share this event with friends and family and stuff, it will be online on our website, the video, within 24 hours, transcripts up shortly after that. And so I think that's all I have, and Grant Smith. And so I'm just going to introduce Grant Smith, who is be moderating and speaking on our first panel, What is the Israel Lobby and How Does It Work? Grant is the director of the Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy, or IRMEP, again, one of the co-sponsors of today's event. He's the author of several books on the Israel Lobby and its various activities. He uh, also recently has been engaged in uh, several lawsuits with the Department of Defense and the CIA in an effort to get information on Israel's nuclear weapons program released. And with that, Grant will take the reins. Thank you, Dale. I want to start uh, with a story, and then I'll introduce our other speakers. And that is about one of those lawsuits. On February 10, the Department of Defense released a document, Critical Technology Issues in Israel, that unequivocally confirms for the first time from a U.S. government source that Israel has an advanced nuclear weapons program and national laboratories equivalent to our Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore laboratories. And that the SORAC reactor, a gift for Adams for Peace from the Eisenhower administration, has, quote, the technology base required for nuclear weapons design and fabrication. This process was 1,132 days and another 140 days in federal court. As many of you know, and this is one reason we're repeating so many of these loops about nuclear weapons, we do have modifications to our Foreign Aid Act of 1961, the Symington and Glenn amendments that occurred in the mid-70s, which explicitly prohibit U.S. foreign aid to countries trafficking in nuclear weapons technologies outside of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And so our question must be how much are Americans at this point owed for all of the aid that was delivered on false pretexts? This amounts to $234 billion as of today. And if there are 122 million U.S. taxpayers, our average refund per taxpayer is that figure up on the screen, $1,900.09 and 54 cents, or $9 and 54 cents. So the question is, as the video say, why do presidents deny that this 
uh, weapons program exists? Why is the press underreported? In this game, as in many games, if you're looking at a con develop and you can't figure out who the mark is or the victim, that's because it's you. In this case, strategic ambiguity, as it's called, is a farce masquerading as grand strategy that started back during the Nixon administration. In 2014, the ISCAP, which is the highest declassification authority in the United States, overruled and released information about the nixon myer negotiations in which Nixon's feelings that he would be, quote, uh, have a Zionist campaign to try to undermine, unquote, him if he did not agree to this gag policy is clear at this point. Israel claims it won't be the first to introduce. Our presidents won't comment on it. Whistleblowers are punished by Department of Energy regulations. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is undermined and taxpayers are both abused and uninformed. And it's not like they don't know. The question to ask is who's being fooled? In a Google consumer survey last year, uh, a majority of Americans, almost 64%, said that they believe the Israelis have a nuclear weapons program. So they're not being fooled. And it's a testament to the power of Israel lobbying organizations in this country that a policy costing so much can last for so long. So what I'd like to talk about are one portion of activist organizations, which I call Israel affinity organizations, uh, which is a tax-exempt portion uh, of this lobbying ecosystem. And just to define that a little bit more, we're going to look at 350 organizations. We're going to look at when they were formed. We're going to look at some of their major functional categories and what could happen in the future as they continue to grow in terms of revenue and resources. So every organization I'm talking about in aggregate is a 501c3 or c4 organization. That's unconditional support for Israel is a top priority. It's headquartered in the US and it's retaining its tax-exempt status. Again, that's almost 350 organizations, but it's not the whole picture. In terms of the whole picture, we realize that in blue, we have this darker and darker puzzle called bundling, campaign contributions premised on support for Israel. In red, we know there are captive media organizations. We know that the Brookings Saban Center is a carve-out of that organization that's very pro-Israel, not counted. Churches, synagogues, not counted. Just the green portion, uh, which is the puzzle piece that we're looking at right now. The first data extract reveals, uh, in terms of the time that they were incorporated or received tax-exempt status, there are four great waves. Um, <clears throat> number one, the wave uh, asking for approval of Zionism, promotion of Zionism and immigration. Phase two, state building the creation of fundraising organizations, the big transfer organizations and subsidy organizations came into play. The 80s and 90s are a period of the media watch and think tanks, the off-splitting of the Washington Institute from the mothership APAC. <clears throat> and the fourth wave, uh, I like to talk the attack, attack lawfare at campus monitoring and messaging are the top priorities of these organizations and later on in the program, uh, there'll be a lot of people talking about um, Israel activity on campus. It's interesting that half of the organizations uh, surveyed, which are the biggest, were created before 1975, and half of them were created after 1975. Uh, this is interesting because it coincides with the period at which the Justice Department, after trying to get the Zionist Organization of America to register as a foreign agent, seven times after ordering the American Zionist Council to register as a foreign agent only to see the lobbying division APAC split off six weeks later and start the same activities, they threw in the towel. And so the number of organizations exploded, as did the amount of US foreign aid, the blue line, uh, in terms of their lobbying successes. So there's this blossoming of foreign aid that occurs right after DOJ threw in the towel. The uh, demands of these organizations, if you review 
tens of thousands of Nexus. Lexus pages have evolved over time from simple recognition to the much more troublesome um, trade concessions. Of course, our first foreign trade agreement was with Israel. Terrorism designation of Israel's enemies, and finally, calls for U.S. military action against Israel's enemies. So these four great waves of Israel affinity organizations leave us asking, what will be the next great wave? Uh, I call the last one the imposition wave, in which we're imposed, told how to think uh, on campus, told uh, what Americans think by the Israel project and its dubious polls, uh, told uh, what's legal and not by the law for uh, project on campus. These campaigns have been so highly successful because um, Americans are fooled. In fact, right now, uh, most Americans, according to a Google Consumer Survey that we took last fall, statistically significant, 58.5% think Iran already has nuclear weapons right now. So just like the run-up to the war in Iraq, where Saddam was believed to be uh, involved in 9-11, involved in possibly uh, having weapons of mass destruction, we're at that point right now in terms of Iran. And who can blame them? with terrifying videos. This is a clip from the Clarion uh, video called Iranium, which shows us these menacing Iranian boats off the eastern seaboard launching nuclear Scud missiles into the United States. If I receive that, watch it, and believe it, of course I think Israel, or excuse me, um, Iran has nuclear weapons. So in aggregate, the total revenue of these 350 organizations has been growing. It suffered a bump, obviously, during 2008. In 2012, it was $3.7 billion a year. The total charitable sector in the US is about $350 billion. That's growing at 4% per year. On average, Israel affinity organizations are growing at 5%. And that makes a big difference over the long run. At present, in aggregate, this sector of 350 organizations with Israel as a top priority uh, are right behind the United Way, the largest tax-exempt organization, and right ahead of the Red Cross. So we're talking about serious money and uh, a very cogent set of uh, different categories of activity. So I'm gonna break them down into subsidy, fundraising and local political action, the advocacy organizations, and education and training, and look at their changes over time. The base of this pyramid are the organizations that collect revenue, tax exempt, send it to Israel, send it as American Friends organizations, American Friends of Technion, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and ship it overseas. The second level, fundraising and local political action, um, are the federations and JCRCs. Then we have advocacy organizations like APAC and finally education organizations. So these subsidy organizations uh, represent about 100 organizations. Um, the largest category members are the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee and these organizations uh, are basically tasks that are very uh, 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 very much active in collecting and transferring revenue. Uh, the second <clears throat> level of the pyramid is much more interesting. It's the fundraising and local political action organizations. There are 152 federations raising large amounts uh, through local fundraising campaigns. Most major fundraising organizations are federations. They give to local uh, Jewish and non-Jewish recipients but they're also giving large amounts uh, in direct transfers to Israel, and their community relations councils are highly active politically, highly active media watchdogs, and also lobby for local city and state initiatives. The General Assembly rivals APAC, except it's a much more comfortable, high-profile gathering of pundits from the media, friendly uh, government officials, et cetera, uh, they are forming more uh, interesting, robust mini APACs in each state, such as the JPAC of California, uh, which is lobbying effectively at the state level. And although they always claim on their websites that they're not uh, official sponsors of APAC events and other political events, 
Uh, they're very uh, active in pushing that national agenda down. Uh, close up, uh, if you look at a uh, foundation in greater Los Angeles, they paid out $50 million in grants, 6.6 .6 in transfers to Israeli organizations, another 3.8 to some of these uh, newer media watchdog, Birthright Israel, which organized trips, the Israel Project, which does research, uh, and money for lobbying to the JPAC of California. If you're not involved in this, the tax impact uh, is still clear. It creates about a $7.8 million hole that others will have to fill. And there's some interesting test cases going on here locally about getting U.S. taxpayers to pay for what was traditionally paid for by the organizations, such as a million dollars in uh, funds for building a new Hillel on campus instead of having the organization pay for it. Taxpayers are paying for it after uh, lobbying by JCRC. In terms of Media Watch, this is the kind of thing they watch out for. This single picture of a Palestinian father who was uh, grieving his dead child uh, was organized against the ombudsman to make sure that uh, this anti-Israeli bias would not be shown on the front page. So uh, Israel Action Center media communications organizations are very active through JCRCs. Uh, the website of the federations boasts of their coverage. They claim 152 of these with the JCRC embedded and not separately reporting uh, taxes or lobbying expenses, uh, but very active in terms of lobbying. So uh, advocacy is everything else. The large organizations that claim to represent these networks, that lobby Congress, get legislation passed, um, and essentially um, work to ensure unfavorable press and buff up Israel's image. If we look at what they're fighting, they're not really fighting other organizations. What they're fighting is public opinion. In a fall survey, 60.7% of Americans, when being advised of the relative levels of aid to Israel, said that they did not support the current levels of aid. It was either much too much or too much. So it takes a lot of money to get increasing, in many cases, uh, annual aid to Israel in the face of massive public opinion that's passive but very clear in polling. Here's another poll. We took this last week. Representative, statistically significant, Google consumer research. Congress, here's the poll question, Congress and state legislatures passed scores of rev resolutions condemning Palestinians and voicing unconditional support for Israel every year. Two questions, these resolutions do not represent my views, these rep uh, resolutions represent my views, they're randomly reversed, almost 70% uh, of Americans say, these don't represent my views. So it takes real money to pass these in state legislatures, in the uh, Congress, uh, in, f in the face of this passive but very significant opposition. So the education and, and training indoctrination uh, segment of Israel affinity groups and organizations is really involved in training uh, within the community, Zionist education. For the American public, it's about Holocaust museums. Uh, for law enforcement, it's about getting the ADL into law enforcement to train them uh, on counterterrorism, uh, and so it's a it's an effort uh, that's collecting about 317 million dollars in 2012, with 14 major Israel affinity organizations uh, propelling that. And so, uh, most Americans, again, in broad uh, in broader scope, according to a 2012 Chicago Council survey don't take one side or the other when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And so it takes real money, uh, real political power to overcome uh, what has been showing up in poll after poll after poll of the general American public. And so that's why I think uh, when you look at the growth of the education segment of Israel affinity organizations, that's been the fastest growing segment since 2001. 
108% over the time period between 2001 and 2012, with subsidy organizations growing at 62%, uh, advocacy at 72 So there's this real effort to reach youngsters, uh, younger and younger, where they are, which is in social media and online, to give them the favorable views uh, that many older Americans have. And it looks like that will continue to be a priority in terms of spending uh, over uh, the future uh, toward the end of the uh, decade as well. So, in terms of employment and volunteers, 14,000 people are on the payroll of organizations that have promoting unconditional support for Israel as a major goal, 353,000 volunteers. And I've listed some of the bigger ones in order, uh, but I would like to go on to what the future portends, and in this case, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, Israel Affinity Group revenue is growing quickly, more quickly than overall charitable donations between 2001 and 2012. We expect that a strong economy, fundraising appeals, and the acceleration since 2008 is going to increase that growth to 9%. And it's worth tracking for one reason. Israel aid is a domestic political issue. It has nothing to do with U.S. national security. It has nothing to do with uh, protecting the United States. It is purely a political issue, and it shows up in the numbers because Aid to Israel closely tracks the amount of spending of Israel affinity organizations. When it goes up, aid goes up. When it goes down, it goes down. It's highly cor correlated. And so I can say with confidence, uh, especially with President Obama making noises of conciliation after this initial Iran agreement, uh, that there will be more aid, secret and public, in the future. And so we see, probably toward the end of the decade, $3.5 in aid increasing to $7 billion a year if this trend of correlation between fundraising, uh, sort of a, uh, a symbol of political support, and aid continues. They're closely related. I would urge, however, every American insist on getting their $1,900 back before this happens. Uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about agency regulatory capture. I already mentioned the Justice Department threw in the towel. It does not enforce laws on the books about foreign agency and uh, consorting with foreign governments and bringing that in as a domestic political issue. Uh, we've had espionage investigations against APAC, the ADL, the Wiseman Institute. They were all quashed by political pressure. The U.S. Treasury Department has never pulled tax-exempt status for any reason more innocuous than failure to file. And yet, the charitable purpose of these organizations is dubious. The American Israel Education Foundation, which was granted tax-exempt status as an education organization in 89, is supposed to educate Americans about the Middle East. And as said, all research will be produced and published and made available to the general public. Well, it never has been. They don't even have a website with more than one page, and that thing was put up a year ago. Um, their observable activities are taking members of Congress on trips to Israel, a thousand of them between 2000 and 2015, and their family members, providing tax deductibility to donors for APAC education, what I would call a disinformation campaign. Uh, a secret source gave us their latest briefing book, and it's essentially a list of points which, if you read it ahead of Netanyahu's speech and his claims, you'd see that the same claims are in this briefing book to Congress, that there is really no negotiation to be done over Jerusalem, um, that because Congress recognizes this in resolutions, they're no longer subject to debate. And so it's really interesting to thumb through that thing and see that it's really not education. APAC, again, has the same sort of problem in terms of um, where it came from and when. Uh, they were incorporated in 1963, six weeks after their parent was shut down. Their tax-exempt organization uh, application in 67 was for charitable education and religious association. But they've been lobbying, just like their parent has, and have never uh, been called on the extremely tight coordination with the Israeli government, 
They've never been prosecuted for obtaining on three occasions classified information to lobby against American industries and pass a free trade agreement, missile secrets to overturn sales to allies, um, and they refuse to register under FARA. Even though they are a successor, the Justice Department is uninterested in that. So uh, I would just have to say, um, in conclusion, that studying the movements uh, of these organizations provides a real insight into the future. Um, our next two panelists will provide a level of detail that's even greater in terms of uh, their observations inside and outside of these organizations. I think uh, I'll just start off then by introducing our next speaker, Seth Morrison, uh, who's held leadership posts in various local, regional, and national Jewish organizations, starting in college as a youth leader in young Judea. He's currently active in Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, he's serving in the D.C. Metro Chapter uh, Steering Committee and on the National Congressional Outreach Committee. In 2011, uh, Seth resigned from the Washington, D.C. Board of the Jewish National Fund in protest over Israel's repeated evictions of Palestinians from their homes in East Jerusalem. So at this point, uh, I'd like to hear from Seth Morrison. Thank you very much. Good morning. So how many people will be joining me on Sunday evening as we watch the next round of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Not too many, but it's a fascinating show. And it's really a chess game between various factions trying to take power in this mythical kingdom. And I think that's a good analogy as we look at the American Jewish community, along with Christian Zionist groups and, and other allies, and how they've become so powerful. So Grant gave us a fascinating picture, and I have to admit, uh, I've learned a few things from it, even though I was actively involved in these groups. And he's shown us the financial and legal side of how our community has become quite powerful. What I'm going to do today is really the opposite, in that I am going to focus on the social side and the community side and talk both about my own experiences and what I've gone through in my transition and also what I've seen and learned about our community. So uh, I guess in some ways you could consider this competitive intelligence. Um, but one thing I want to start with is a realization that I've had on some of the work I've been doing in the last year, is that a major reason why our community is so strong on the political side and in the financial side is that in the 30s and 40s, we were a total failure. And if you think back, um, and you know, those of you who've read history, who've studied the Great Depression, who studied World War II, you know that we talk in the Jewish community a lot about the Holocaust. But in the 1930s, especially the latter part of the 30s, it was pretty well known that the Holocaust was really bad. Now, we, we didn't know that there were mechanized death camps, but there were a lot of stories about how serious the situation was. But at, this but at the time, the US had clamped down on visas. My four grandparents all came from Eastern Europe before World War I. But those who stayed back and tried to get in later couldn't do so. So basically, our community, even though we were thriving and doing well economically, we didn't have political influence. Then during World War II, when we knew about the death camps, our greatest leaders went to Roosevelt and said, bomb the rail lines, save some lives, stop people from going to the camps. 
And Roosevelt said no. Now, we talk today about the power of our community, and we talk about the fact that the presidents and Congress take direction. But understand that that came from colossal failure. And that that colossal failure motivated our community and the, and the leaders at the time to sit down and say, okay, guys, how are we going to overcome this? So taking that personally, I was born in 51. And when I started Sunday school in my synagogue at age three, we marched around in blue shorts and little white caps playing kibbutzniks. And we were told how these wonderful, brave people were out there saving our people and creating a homeland. All of the clergy members and religious school teachers in, our, in my synagogue and in most of the other synagogues were Holocaust survivors. Now, it was sort of a charitable thing. These people came through utter terror. Th they hadn't gone to college. They needed jobs. We found them jobs. As kids, I have to admit, we were pretty cruel. You know, we made jokes about their accents and, and, and all of that. But that lesson also came through that these were people to be revered and were, were through terrible things. We also knew that you didn't really talk about being Jewish too much outside of the home in the synagogue. I mean, there was not a lot of anti-Semitism on Long Island in, in the mid-50s and 60s, but we were aware that we were different. But suddenly came June of 67, and everything changed phenomenally with the Six-Day War. We won. We were victors. We were no longer victims. And that made a tremendous difference. And our community, you know, took on a whole different light. That caused me to get involved in Zionist youth work and become very active in it in, in high school and college. And that was, of course, pure indoctrination. I mean, the only me mention we had of, of the Palestinians came with the word terrorists or with the word refugees because they voluntarily left Israel on their own because Israel was going to be driven into the sea. And you have to understand that this is what I've been hearing since I was three years old. This is not something that was new. This was our lives. This was our family. This was our history. You know, when we get family gatherings, we talked about the cousins who made it out and the cousins who didn't. You know, we talked about cousins who lived in Canada because they couldn't get into the U.S. So, you know, this was a, a major indoctrination. So after college, um, I did not move to Israel. Uh, I was sort of a failure in the, the Zionist world. Started my career in cable television, and my second job caused me to leave Long Island and move to Cincinnati, Ohio. So I'm in a new community. I know a few people at work. What do you do? Well, you look for the Jewish community. And you know, I found the Jewish person at work, and she took me to her synagogue one day, and then I went to some other synagogues. You get involved in your community. It's, it, I think it's only a natural thing. Well, what happens when you do that is suddenly somebody comes over to you and says, hey, welcome to town, you know, there's this committee, maybe you want to help us out, and hey, you know, I know you don't earn a lot of money, you're young, and we're glad to have you, but, you know, you've got to get used to giving. It's our culture, it's our history. And, you know, you can only give 25 bucks, give 25, we respect that. And it became an indoctrination. Um, I then moved on to Seattle, Tacoma, and there I was, you know, a little more senior, I'd been promoted, had a new job, and they said, will you join our young leadership? Well, hey, you know, there's some status and, you know, get more involved. And then they said, you know, we've decided that we're going to do a young leadership mission to Israel. Now, I'd been to Israel with the Zionist group. I'd been there a few times. But suddenly I was official. You know, you're going on a mission. And, you know, they took us to the Golan Heights and we looked down at the kibbutzim who were being bombed. And they took us to Gaza. And we met with this woman who told us about 
how she was willing to live there with her young children even though it was in danger because this was our land. This was the fulfillment of our dream. These things all made a, made a tremendous difference and they make an impression on young Jews, even like those like me who are not particularly religious. It's a way, you know, it's an involvement, it's an identity. Now, my career took me to the Bay Area and really by coincidence, I had a, a couple of things happen at once. A friend of mine from the youth movement who was basically a member when I was a leader and I'd sort of stayed in touch with, became a pro-Palestinian activist. And he actually went out and learned Arabic and talked about the fact that, you know, these aren't bad people. And frankly, he called me and asked for some money but, you know, told me what he was doing and, and, and the work he was doing and basically said, you know, you're not hearing the whole story. And that started a, a long round of changes. Also, equally by coincidence, um, I met somebody who was involved in the New Israel Fund. And for those of you who don't know the New Israel Fund, it is a Jewish charity, or an Israeli charity, that focuses on civil society, democracy, human rights. It um, supports many of the civil rights groups that are working on behalf of Palestinians. The one thing they do not do is support BDS, but they are very much progressive, very much in light of things that, that most of us in this room would support. Um, but, but when you get into that question of what is a Zionist, you know, they will tell you that they believe in a Jewish state. But the biggest thing that happened to me is that I got involved in an organization called the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies. Also through ties from the youth group and, and family friends. Arava is university level education on the environment for Hebrew speakers, Arabic speakers, Palestinians and Jordanians, and North Americans. And that became my major personal fundraising focus for a number of years, and took me to Israel a few times, and gave me the, ch the opportunity to meet many young Palestinians who were basically saying, I'm so concerned about the environment that I'm willing to sit and live and work with Israelis so that we can work together on the environment. And many stories I could tell you, but um, the one I think hits closest to home is that a few years ago, we had a couple of, of uh, Arava alumni, one Israeli-American woman and a Palestinian man, uh, his name was Anton, who lived in uh, Bet Lechem and had studied at the Institute. And he was, they were here on a fundraising tour and we had a day off here in DC. And I said, okay, you know, what do you guys want to do? You know, you have all of DC, I'll be your tour guide. And they both said, we want to go to the Smithsonian. We've heard, you know, about these museums. So we went first to natural history because uh, Anton is an ornithologist and wanted to see that collection. Then when we finished, um, we had a cup of coffee and I said, okay, what do you want to do? And we were looking at the map of the Smithsonian. And to be honest, I almost fell off my chair because Anton said, I want to go to the Holocaust Museum. I've heard all my life about the Holocaust and how the Holocaust is the reason for Israel and how the Holocaust justifies Israel, but I've never really understood it. Can we go there? Now, those of you who tried to go to the Holocaust Museum know that they're sold out most of the time. You need tickets to get in. And, you know, I sort of got my courage up and I went up to the information desk and said, you know, I have a weird story for you. Uh, I'm Jewish, I don't have tickets, but I have a Palestinian man from Bethlehem who wants to learn about the Holocaust. Can I please have some tickets? The woman looked at me like I was nuts and she said, well, I have to talk to my supervisor. But the supervisor came out and I told her the whole story and she said, sure, we're honored. And we, we did our tour. We came out and we were both pretty emotional. You know what it's like to visit that museum. 
And I said, Anton, what do you think? And Anton said, I never knew. I never understood what this was. I never understood how horrible it was. Thank you for taking me. This is terrible. But then he took a deep breath, and, and I'm glad he trusted me enough to say this. Uh, and he has, by the way, given me permission to share this story. He said, but how does that justify what I go through at the checkpoints? Brilliant. <laughs> and I think that's a very important learning, that we have to, to separate these things. So I went through, I became a uh, J Street activist. I got involved in JNF because of Arava, because Arava gets its funding from JNF, and it was a way to bring more money in. But uh, then I found out that the JNF was stealing homes from Palestinians in East Jerusalem, and I had been told that wasn't happening when I got involved, so I resigned there. But I stayed in J Street and for a couple more years, but then I started finding that J Street, while they're saying all these wonderful things, is not getting anything done, and is not willing to use the power that they had gained to really make change. That as long as they were unwilling to challenge aid, as long as they were unwilling to say, veto these UN resolutions, you know, I realized that J Street just wasn't going to work. And that's when I resigned and uh, joined Jewish Voice for Peace. And it's helped me, you know, over the last couple of years to understand a lot more about these organizations, about this structure, and while still respecting the Zionist idea, because that is part of my heritage and culture, I also, you know, have realized that the current situation is untenable. And, you know, I don't know how we're going to solve this. One state, two states, there's a lot of healthy debate. But it's clear that strong, aggressive action is going to be required to make change. And that's what I think groups like JVP and others like, like most of you are willing to do. So let me take this discussion back to the broad level and uh, pick up uh, on where Grant left off. And um, what I want to talk about is the group that really is responsible for the strength of the Jewish community. And most of you would probably say that that's APAC. But I will respectfully say that that's wrong. Uh, do we have the first slide on here? Uh, you can just go back. Those are, the, uh, those are the source books. Right. Oh, we don't have the other slide on here. Oh, OK. Um, missing a slide, but that's fine. The group that is really in charge that you don't hear about very often, excuse me, is the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations. Now, if you look at these slides, you will see on these slides 53 organizations that are every large Jewish group with the exception of J Street and Jewish Voice for Peace. All of the synagogue groups, all of the fundraising groups, all of the political groups, all of the influencing organizations, 53 people in one room control those groups. How many people know who the board of APAC is? Now, and I have to admit, Grant told me this one when we were getting ready for this presentation. Um, and I sort of knew it, but I didn't realize it as directly. The Conference of Presidents, these 53 people, are the board of APAC. It is in that body that these decisions are made and that all of this confluence come together. The synagogues get their marching orders. The universities get their marching orders. The charities get their marching orders from those 53 people. And every once in a while, you'll meet a liberal Zionist like, like I was and they'll say, you know, we stood up and we argued for the Palestinians. Well, you know what happens? They're outvoted, 50 to 3. And they stand up and they say, I argued for the Palestinians. And they may feel good and they go to all these fancy meetings, but the reality is that 
they're ignored. So let me just give you two conclusions that I hope you'll keep with you uh, throughout the day and throughout your work. One is that we have to understand who our opponents are, and we have to use the same skills. We have to find a way to unify our groups, whether it be church groups or peace groups or, or mosques, and organize ourselves as strongly as our opponents because they are strong, and they've put together a, a, a wonderful organization that somebody could do a case study on. We must learn from them and use that. The second thing is, I only have a moment left, but many of you have heard about a Palestinian initiative against what is called normalization. And it's a very valid issue that says that Palestinians should not participate in activities that normalize the occupation or show them on the same level as Israelis, because clearly they're not. And I support that initiative, but I will also say that I would not be here today if I hadn't met Anton and so many other Palestinians willing to educate me about their life story and about their history and about why there's another side. So especially as we look at American Jewish communities, we have to talk to them. We have to reach out to them. And it's not easy. And you'll hear things we don't like. But especially, we have to bring Palestinians to them and say why they're mistreated and how they're mistreated and share their stories so that we can all learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Seth Morrison. Um, if you'd like to start passing comment cards to our collectors, Tabitha or Sebastian, you can start doing that. Um, our crack journalist from Japan over there at the table, you need to move out because we're going to use that uh, Twitter feed to collect collection uh, questions as well. So thank you, um, Rai. Um, so our next speaker is Jeffrey Blankfurt. He's a photojournalist and radio host. He made his first trip to Lebanon and Jordan in the 1970s to take photos for a book on the Palestinian struggle that led to his involvement in their cause. He became a founding member of the November 29th Committee on Palestine and the co-founder of the Labor Committee uh, on the Middle East. And he currently hosts a twice-monthly program on the international affairs uh, for KZYX, the public radio station in Mendocino County in Northern California. Please welcome Jeff Blankford. <laughs> oh my. I see my time is ticking off here. First of all, I'd like to welcome you to the most important Israeli-occupied territory, Washington, in case you had any confusion about that. Um, and that will be proven by the fact there'll be no coverage of this event in the national media, as what happened last year, although C-SPAN did cover the event last year, not this year. Well, the, the Anti-Defamation League I'm going to talk about today was formed by B'nai B'rith, the, the world's oldest Jewish organization, 101 years ago, last October. It was formed to, quote, to stop the defamation of the Jewish people to secure justice and fair treatment to all citizens alike, and to put an end forever to unjust and unfair discrimination against and ridicule of any sect or body of citizens, end quote. By 1937, however, it was already in the spying business, providing information to the federal government about individuals and groups that it considered to be subversive. One of them was the first House Committee on Un-American Activities, run by Martin Dyes, whose antipathy to Jews was well known, and among his first targets was the National Lawyers Guild, the majority of his members who happened to be Jews. A decade later, in 1947, it joined the House Committee on Un-American Activities uh, in the Hollywood witch hunts, acting as a liaison for those Jewish witnesses who wished to inform on their friends and offering information on those who refused to do so. In October that year, hearings before the House Committee on Executive Department Expenditures revealed that the Civil Service Commission, without congressional authorization, was collecting information on individuals who had not applied for jobs with the Civil Service. 
the alleged subversives. And they were providing us information, not just the Civil Service Administration, but with the FBI and HUAC. This appalled committee chair, Michigan Democrat Claire Hoffman. When asked to define the groups that had provided the Civil Service the information, Hoffman said, I will tell you that they are smear artists. He was mainly referring to the ADL, which had provided information to the committee and up to 7,000 individuals. Um, mind you, this was a year before Israel came into being and reflected more the nature of the ADL than its commitment to Zionism. But this would change. With the anti-Jewish discrimination no longer a problem, protecting and propagandizing, excuse me, preparing, uh, protecting and propagandizing for the new state of Israel and censoring its critics and intimidating those potential critics came to dominate ADL's agenda and has since. Long before Abe Fox, Foxman became the national director, its leadership had already invented the new anti-Semitism, equating criticism of Israel with disliking Jews. In 1971, True Magazine interviewed three top officials of the ADL who boasted of its use of undercover agents. And, and the interviewer said, ADL must have a pretty extensive spy network to do all that. Well, it did. It became evident in 1993 when an unprecedented police raid on ADL San Francisco headquarters revealed that its number one investigator, Roy Bullock, um, he, that's how the ADL's chief spy, there he is, uh, described him, um, was, um, had, had, was taken part in, Israel, in APAC's nationwide, excuse me, the ADL's nationwide spying organization. The uh, majority of information in his files had been illegally obtained, according to the police, and violations committed by the ADL were so great that the district attorney said there were possibly 48 felonies they would be charged with. At the time of the raid, Bullock was being paid as a cutout, unofficially, for 30 years by a Beverly Hills attorney who was an ADL official, so it would not appear on his records, the ADL's records. At the first ADL, denied even to senior staff members that Bullock was one of theirs. A memo sent to ADL's regional directors simply referred to, quote, information was found in the possession of an individual who is alleged to have a relationship with the ADL, end quote. The memo also attacked reports falsely implying that ADL worked covertly with Tom Girard to monitor Arab Americans, end quote. That was a reference to a police inspector, Tom Gerard, of the San Francisco police, whose earlier arrest for unlawfully possessing thousands of computerized files and Arab Americans had sparked the story in the first place. Well, proof of this was a confidential memo of a meeting with the ADL office, in the ADL office with Gerard, about a Palestinian Bay Area activist and the information was then sent to Erwin Sewell, the chief spy master of the ADL in New York. Bullock, who worked with Girard, was being paid $25,000 annually through this cutout, as I mentioned, and he, to, he was, his job was to infiltrate and spy on Arab American organizations and those who he referred to as, in his files, anti-democratic organizations and individuals. Some like neo-Nazis, militia groups, and skinheads did come under that category, but the majority didn't fit that category. According to um, more than 700 documents released by the district attorney, Bullock's files contain information on 77 Arab and Palestinian organizations and 647 groups that Bullock labeled PINKO and anti-apartheid groups. What Bullock labeled PINKO were organizations from every sector of the progressive social, legal, and political spectrum, from the NAACP to the Asian Law Caucus, United Farm Workers, and so on. Uh, group, um, any group that might eventually take a position on the Israel-Palestine conflict, there he kept files on. The names of more than 12,000 people on whom he kept files that were never released. The decision to make what he had public effectively ended the district attorney's political career. Uh, but then he caved in to pressure from the Jewish establishment and didn't file any charges against anybody. It didn't help him, however. 
Um, a separate section of Bullock's files were devoted to groups opposing South African apartheid, including the African National Congress, which the ADL vehemently opposed. His surveillance of anti-apartheid activists reflected ADL's efforts to keep information about Israeli-South African ties from going public. Since as Bullock acknowledged, he was already collecting this material for the ADL when he went to work for South African intelligence officially and being paid for South African intelligence, he was already doing that work. He didn't have to do any more work. His career began to unravel when he infiltrated the Labor Committee on the Middle East, which Bay Area labor and anti-apartheid activist Steve Zeltzer and I founded in 1987. Bullock attended the first two meetings at Zeltzer's house and, um, and, and he, had, he had infiltrated a anti-apartheid uh, group uh, that was supporting an imprisoned South African labor activist. And that's the way Steve invited him to come to the first meeting. And I had met him because he had infiltrated the Arab, American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, where because of his beefy appearance, he worked as security at their events. Um, Shortly thereafter, I received in the mail a page from the Journal of the Institute for Historical Review, uh, which claimed that Bullock, who had attended its conferences, had been working for the ADL and spying for it for 25 years. While no fan of that group, I suspected what it said about Bullock was true. So Steve and I met with him and showed him the article and asked for his response. He denied working for the ADL, but he did say that he had attended its, uh, the conferences of the Institute for Historical Review. And he'd done so, he said, in order to recruit members for the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, which of course is the last place the ADC would want to recruit members, but the ADL would want them to because they could blame and smear the ADC by saying they're pro-Nazi or Holocaust deniers and so on. Having made some inquiries on my own ahead of that meeting, I asked Bullock to explain why he happened to turn up at so many Palestinian conferences around the country. Well, he was an art dealer, he explained, and by coincidence, his trips to buy art, coincidentally, were at the same time that Palestinians were holding conferences around the country. <laughs> well, to back that up, and this is important, he provided references to two art galleries that he said would back him up as being an art dealer. Well, Steve and I, realized that this guy was a fraud. He was actually despised. We didn't bother checking the references, but I kept those references. And so when the Gerard story broke in the paper, I thought that there was a connection between Bullock and Gerard. And so I called Dennis O'Patterney, who was the examiner reporter writing about the story, and I said to him, does the name Bullock mean anything to you? And he said, boy, does it. At that point, it was only a last name in Gerard's files. And so I gave him the name of the art galleries, and he called the art galleries, and then the story broke. And um, ABC came out, photographed Bullock on the streets of San Francisco, and it became the big story in the local newspapers. And I was attacked in Jewish newspapers from Jerusalem Post, Jewish Forward, Washington Jewish Week, um, for having done that, having exposed their spy. Um, by a twist of fate, ABC wanted to speak to one of the people who had been spied on by Bullock, and so the assistant district attorney, John, John Dwyer, uh, gave them Steve's file, and in Steve's file was my name. So Steve called me to tell me, you're in my file. So I called Dwyer. Uh, it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, could I get my file? He said, sure, come over and get it. And I wasn't that far from the Hall of Justice, so I went over to get it. And if I hadn't done that, I never would have seen the file because that night, thanks to an ADL request, the files were closed and have been closed ever since. That enabled us to have a case. Um, the information on mine was a mixed bag, much of it sloppy, most of it wrong, such as my having married a woman in 1963 who I never heard of. <laughs> it also contained my social security number, which the ADL had no business legally having. And the information clearly had come from the FBI, with whom the ADL has had a long working relationship. Well, attorney and congressman Pete McCloskey, former congressman, himself a target of the ADL, um, 
he believed we should file a class action suit against the league and that he would do it pro bono. If it was not for McCloskey, we would not have had a case because other lawyers would never have taken this case because it would have damaged their political career. To qualify as a plaintiff, one had to either or support a Palestinian or, or oppose Israeli policies or oppose apartheid in South Africa. Steve and I had done both. Initially, there were 19 individuals in the case. 16 dropped out, however, when they were afraid that if we lost, they'd have to pay court costs. That left, left me, Steve, and a woman, Anne Poirier, who was an anti-apartheid activist in the case. And um, McCloskey single-handedly faced down a brace of the ADL attorneys from the, from the highest paid and the largest uh, law firm in San Francisco at the time. We contended the ADL had violated the California right to privacy that was designed to prevent institutions like the ADL from having public information and distributing it to other sources. And, and that's what the courts would determine, that the ADL had taken our information and given it to Israel and South Africa. In 2002, after almost 10 years in the courts, the ADL threw in the towel. On the Friday before the Monday, when the court had determined we should go to trial, the ADL um, offered a monetary settlement for which we would not have to sign a confidentiality agreement, which would have prohibited me from speaking about the case as I'm doing now. And that's the reason the case went so long. We would not sign that agreement. What did the ADL want us to talk about? Well, one thing, a bullet was being paid by the South African intelligence for spying on black South African exiles, and that he had followed and reported on the travels of Chris Hani, a young black South African leader who was expected to become president one day after Nelson Mandela, and uh, who was later assassinated. It didn't want the public to know that in Bullock's files was a floor plan and a key to the office of Alex Oda, who is a, the leader of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee in Orange County, who had, Bullock had befriended, and that was in his files, and Bullock was never asked about how he had these files, had the key and the floor plan of Oda's office in his files. Um, ADL also wanted to bury the fact that it was operating a national spy network and had seven spies around the country and different, at least seven spies like Bullock working in different Arab American communities reporting information to the ADL. A telling moment came when uh, Pete brought um, Victor Ostrovsky, the former Mossad agent, down to Redwood City for a deposition. And the ADL lawyers asked him to give him the information that he had taken from Mossad when he had left Israel and used it for his book. So here's the, the ADL lawyers asking the former Mossad agent for the, his files from Mossad. You want a connection between ADL and Mossad? It's right there. Um, it was, I don't know, of course, it was logical, but back in 1961, there was a letter from, from one from the uh, head of the uh, ADL, uh, Ben Epstein, uh, which he bragged about how the Israel uh, and the ADL provided information to the government of Israel and the government of the United States. So, uh, and he bragged about that when Joftis who was the head of the B'nai B'rith complained, uh, Joftis was fired. He said the ADL shouldn't be doing that said Joftis, and so Joftis lost his job. Um, the police investigation of the ADL in San Francisco was unusual because the ADL had collaborated, was collaborating with police all around the country, and the San Francisco police, when they went to Los Angeles, which was heavily infiltrated, heavily infiltrated by the ADL, the LA Police Department, the LAPD would not collaborate or cooperate with the San Francisco police in the investigation. Um, the San Francisco police behavior was not atypical. Um, for years, the ADL has been incurring the favors of police chiefs and law enforcement officials across the country, sending them on all expense paid trips to Israel. Uh, Gerard had been on one of those trips. According to the ADL's 2013 990 tax filing, 890 law enforcement personnel had been through its, quote, advanced training school on extremist and terrorist threats, and more than 85,000 had undergone training in conjunction with the Holocaust Museum here. Uh, how that was expected to benefit Americans, uh, I, I don't know. 
In one of his publications designed for law enforcement officials, the ADL boasted that, quote, through strategic cooperation with the FBI, Israeli police, and others, we facilitate the exchange of information and best practices regarding extremist threats. Law enforcement officials at the federal, state, and local levels turn to ADL repeatedly for assistance and value our expertise. We exchange with law enforcement personnel across the country on a daily basis, monitoring individual extremists and extremist groups. It's a scary scenario, but not without its ardent supporters, such as FBI Director James Comey. On April 28th, a year ago, addressing the ADL's national conference, Comey thanked the organization for having trained more than 12,000 law enforcement personnel the previous year, and since 2010, he said, FBI employees have participated in more than 105 training sessions sponsored by the ADL on extremism and hate crimes in 17 states and here in, in Washington, D.C. Your leadership, he said to the ADL, in tracking and exposing domestic and international terrorist threats is invaluable, and the training you voluntarily provide at conferences and classrooms at the community level is eye-opening and insightful. If this sounds a bit like a love letter to the ADL, he said, it is, and rightly so. Reality check, shortly after Comey's talk, Rand Smith here, under the Freedom of Information Act, requested copies of the training materials used in the ADL sessions with the FBI. According to the Justice Department, they couldn't find any. Second reality check, and closing up here, in November 1983, Leonard Zakim, executive director of the ADL's New England office in Boston, sent campus Jewish leaders a booklet, quote, a booklet containing background information on pro-campus Arab sympathizers who are active on college campuses, telling them that if, quote, you need more information on these individual groups or any others, please call us, end quote. He encouraged them to pass knowledge on that they may have on other individuals and groups onto us so we can have a more complete and useful listing, end quote. In a postscript, he cautioned that, quote, this booklet should be considered confidential because it easily could be misconstrued, end quote. Among the names were Professor Edward Said and Senator James Aberesk. The booklet's existence was not made public until January 1985 when the Middle East Studies Association was preparing to pass a resolution asking the ADL to disown the document. When questioned about it by the New York Times, Zakim said the document had been careless and that he would not have written the cover letter if he considered the matter thoroughly. Given it had been distributed more than a year before that, it's obvious the only thing that Zakim regretted was that he'd been caught. His reputation survived that. In 2002, Boston had a new bridge, and they named it the Leonard P. Zakim Bunker Hill Memorial Bridge, after Zakim and the American colonists who fought the British at Bunker Hill. I would very much doubt that if those colonists were around today, they would like to be linked with the ADL. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have these mics on? OK, that's great. So uh, our next panel should be assembling over uh, on the side. Again, uh, if we can have Jeff Blankford's questions brought up to him directly. <clears throat> um, we're going to start the next panel right on time, so we've got about five minutes for questions. You can always ask us later as well. Uh, I've got a few questions here. Uh, question number one, can't Arab allies of the US use the legal approach of lobbying to influence the US Congress? The answer is no. Uh, the 1938 Foreign Agents Registration Act is selectively enforced. If you're Pakistani, uh, you will uh, be prosecuted if you attempt to do this. It is, only, um, uh, it is only one country that really has a total exemption to this. Uh, question number two, how many A-bombs does Israel have? I don't know. Uh, Jimmy Carter, after he left office, speculated it was uh, 100 or 150, something yeah, like that. 300. 300, okay, thank you. Um, Saw him this morning, make it. All righty. Uh, we, uh, okay, I quoted documents proving that Israel has nuclear weapons laboratories equivalent to Los Alamos. Does that mean uh, that it not only has a fission bomb, but also a fusion bomb? The report, again, you can find it online, Critical Technology Assessment in Israel and NATO Nations, 
Uh, it states unequivocally that in 1987 they were developing the codes they needed to build uh, hydrogen bombs. So look at the report, um, but it's pretty unequivocal. So um, I'll leave it to Seth. Uh, he's going to go through his questions. Okay, I'll try to go through these quickly because there's a lot here. Um, how could or should you delegitimatize the Israel lobby without delegitimatizing Israel itself? Do you think Israel is sustainable? You know, in all honesty, I don't know. Um, what I do know is that, you know, we tend to focus on the Israel-South Africa analogy. And there is a problem with that analogy in that in South Africa, the whites were like 10% and the blacks were like 90%. In Israel, roughly 50% of the people are Jewish. We have a, a horrible situation with competition for the land. And we have to find a way to be fair to all of them. And hopefully better minds than mine can do that. Um, does APAC mentor or develop people in Washington at the senior level? Um, I'd say it's the wrong question. Uh, because what, is, what APAC does is it starts at the beginning. Um, in local communities, APAC is politically neutral. They recruit both Democrats and Republicans and go to see everybody. So if you run for city council or state legislator, somebody's gonna come over to you and say, hi, I'm a Democrat. If you're a Democrat, then I'm a Democrat. I'm from APAC. We just wanted to say hi, and by the way, here's my check. Now it's somebody who was probably gonna give him a check anyway, but he's doing it through APAC so that he gets the influence. So by the time they get to DC, they're already purchased. You want me to go through? I want you to do one more and then okay. Jeff has the final. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, uh, this is an interesting one. Talk about the funding of the Conference of Presidents. Uh, again, it's a non-issue. These are the heads of the groups that, that we just heard raised millions. The Conference of Presidents is, is unbelievably small. It has one executive, and I think, maybe if I re read correctly, it's like five or six staff. They do it, th they, they're a decision-making body, not a, an operational body. So funding for them is not an issue. It's interesting, uh, Malcolm Hodeline, who's a longtime executive director of the Conference of Presidents, okay. bragged back in 1995, when Clinton was uh, president, as having been like the architect helping to form the first counterterrorism and death penalty act, which, which added the number of possible death penalties under the federal law, but also really responsible for making it almost impossible for Arab Americans to donate money to Palestinian organizations without possibly being arrested for, for collaborating with a terrorist organization. So they're very instrumental, and they have access to uh, the offices of every member of Congress. We've got 55 seconds, 49. One other thing I should say about APAC, which we'll be hearing about later, is they have their meetings and dinners and luncheons all over the country, and they, they invite uh, members of, of all the local officials, mayors, city councilmen, supervisors, police chiefs, anyone who's a potential candidate for Congress. And when they leave, then the local federations, Jewish organizations, then send those officials on all expense paid trips to Israel. So by the time when they come back, they realize that this, these organizations are powerful politically and they're ambitious politicians. They know where the bread is buttered. And so they're in Israel's pocket even before they run for Congress. Thank you very much. Next panel, please. Thank you.
Greetings. Uh, while we're getting our name tags straight and uh, uh, everyone is getting seated, I have been asked to ask everyone not to stream. So we're streaming this online for everyone. And so if you have your iPhone or Android, whatever, don't bother to stream. Uh, let the, uh, because uh, as the modern phenomena is, you look at the picture from upstairs and everybody's holding a camera. Uh, so please don't stream. I'm Askia Muhammad. I'm a news director at WPFW-FM. That's the Pacifica station here in Washington. I write a column for the Washington Informer newspaper here and I'm a senior editor at the Final Call newspaper. I'd like to, as I introduce this distinguished panel, remind you of the, one of the things I considered so important about this event. The event has collected what I would say are unimpeachable witnesses uh, to something that is an unspoken reality, an unspoken truth. And so just bear that in mind. The witnesses are unimpeachable. There are a couple of things I'd like to commend to your attention. Yesterday, April the 9th, was the 150th anniversary of the uh, surrender of the treasonous rebel leader, General Robert E. Lee, the, the Army of the Northern Virginia surrendered unconditionally to the United States Army led by Ulysses Grant. I say treasonous and traitorous because it was 110 years after General Lee's death before his citizenship in the United States of America, the US of A, was restored. They were in rebellion, they were uh, formed a armed uprising against the United States of America, which I think constitutes treason and traitor behavior. <clears throat> I mention that because at that, after this surrender unconditionally, it ushered in 100 years of American apartheid, um, which ended ostensibly with the passage of the Civil Rights Acts and the 1960s Civil Rights Movement. I use the word apartheid because a clone, and it was just referred to of the United States of America, uh, the US of A, uh, the U of S A, uh, South Africa, really perfected the apartheid uh, regime and uh, brought it into existence. And it seemed even up until the presidency of Ronald Reagan that it might endure forever. But as uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reminds us, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. South African apartheid was dismantled. Today, President, former President Jimmy Carter says what no president, no sitting president can ever say, uh, and has, will say, uh, in the cover of his book, the title of his new book, uh, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. And when this question is raised, why are you calling this apartheid? Well, in some ways it is an apartheid state, although the population is 50-50. And if there were a one state solution, boy, uh, one person, one vote, uh, you'd have a questionable outcome. Nevertheless, the arc of the moral universe is long. It bends toward justice. This event today is a witness of that because I think I heard uh, uh, Grant Smith say, this a similar event was organized a few months ago and about one fourth the participants were here. And so this is growing, the BDS movement is growing. And so uh, prepare to understand that um, you are not alone. <clears throat> the uh, guests I'm going to introduce, and I guess we'll have them speak in alphabetical order again, unimpeachable. Please allow me to uh, present for his remarks, uh, Richard Anderson Falk. He is a professor emeritus. <laughs> of international law at Princeton University. Ah, which reminds me of the final quote I'd like to share with you on April the 9th. And uh, it, April the 9th is the, which again reminds us of the, 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 the veracity and the, and the, the eventual um, success of this event uh, or of this cause, this movement. 
On April 9th in 1898, Paul Robeson, world citizen, was born in Princeton University, where Professor Falk was a, is a emeritus professor. Uh, his, he made a statement which uh, certainly speaks to this event. Quote, the answer to injustice is not to silence the critic, but to end the injustice. In the words of Paul Robeson. <clears throat> Professor Falk is a, a professor emeritus. He's the author and co-author of 20 books and the co-editor of the 20 volumes, including Achieving Human Rights, Israel, Palestine, on record. Uh, he has also a, served for uh, several years from 2008 to 2014 as the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Palestinian territories occupied since 1967. Please welcome our first unimpeachable witness. Alarming, but. Uh, let me first say that I'm uh, honored and happy to be part of this important event and thank the conveners for bringing us together. It's, it's, it reveals the two sides of the present uh, reality that should be both encouraging and disturbing. The one side being that there are growing voices that seek justice and peace for both peoples. And this kind of gathering, I think, is an affirmation of that. But it's also true, as Jeff Blankford reminded us, uh, that there's a dreadful asymmetry in the way in which the public is informed about these realities. The media uh, indulges in a kind of feasting whenever they get the opportunity to celebrate uh, pro-Israeli uh, happenings, and they practice the opposite in relation to any kind of balanced inquiry into the realities of the conflict. And we must keep both of those realities in mind if we are to understand the situation correctly. Uh, there are no better texts for assessing the damage done to the role and reputation of the United Nations by the Israeli lobby than Secretary of State John Kerry's recent statements about efforts within the UN by the US to protect Israel from the fulfillment of its responsibilities under international law and in relation to the UN. Uh, despite the recent tensions arising over the Netanyahu speech to Congress, Kerry boasted almost at the same time on ABC News, quote, we have intervened on Israel's behalf a couple of hundred times in over 75 different fora within the UN. And when addressing the Human Rights Council in Geneva, Kerry included a statement that could have been drafted by APAC or Israel's ambassador at the UN when he said, it must be said that the Human Rights Council's obsession with Israel actually risks undermining the credibility of the entire organization. And further, we will oppose any effort by any group or participant in the UN system to arbitrarily and re regularly delegitimize or isolate Israel, not just in the Human Rights Council, but wherever it occurs. What is striking about such statements by our highest ranking government officials dealing with foreign policy 
is the disconnect between these unconditional, uh, the, between this unconditional support and Israel's record of disregard for its obligations under international law and with respect to the authority of the United Nations. When speaking uh, in, at the March APAC uh, meetings, uh, Representative Lindsey Graham went even further when he told the audience uh, that when, he, when serving as chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, I'm gonna put the UN on notice that I will go after the UN funding if the organization takes any steps to marginalize Israel. During my six years as UN Special Rapporteur for Occupied Palestine, I had the opportunity to observe the manner in which international and national so-called NGOs give pri priority uh, to discrediting those uh, who offer any critical assessment of Israel's conduct. And it's, uh, these are so-called uh, NGOs because they're so closely aligned uh, with the governmental priorities and viewpoints of Israel that they should be really known as quasi-governmental organizations. And I think of UN Watch and others in that uh, category. There are really two ways that this effort to uh, devalue and discredit uh, the UN and its uh, activities takes place. One is to attack individuals, and the other is to attack the organization itself. Uh, most uh, consistently, a reliance on defamatory attacks on the critics as biased and even anti-Semitic whenever someone describing Israeli violations of international uh, uh, law or sympathetically reporting on uh, Palestinian grievances. Coupled with this kind of personal attack is an avoidance of substantive aspects as to whether the criticisms or grievances are well-founded from the perspective of international law and human rights law. In other words, these, at these defamatory attacks are disassociated from whether their substance is grounded in fact and reasonable interpretations of uh, relevant law. <clears throat> Even those uh, defamatory attacks, at least in my case, focused on distorted presentations of my views on a variety of issues that were made in settings other than the UN and did not pertain to the Israeli-Palestine uh, conflict. The intended, the intended effect was to shift attention from the messenger uh, containing uh, these uh, issues uh, to the uh, message itself. In other words, uh, instead of uh, focusing on the message, the hope was to generate a controversy about a disreputable messenger. With incredible persistence, UN Watch in particular circulated their defamatory attacks to prominent international personalities, including high-ranking civil servants in the UN itself, uh, such as the UN Secretary General and the High Commissioner for Human Rights and a variety of ambassadors uh, of countries friendly to Israel. What was particularly disturbing uh, to me was the extent to which these defamatory attacks were treated without examination as credible by supposedly responsible officials here in Washington 
and New York, who didn't even bother to check with me or with the sources that were being relied upon and led uh, to the endorsement of such uh, defamation in ways damaging to my reputation, but more significantly, diverting attention uh, from the substance of Israeli uncontestable violations of fundamental international law and human rights law. And that's the, it's what I call the politics of deflection. Instead of talking about the real issues that should be discussed within the UN, the effort is to get people to talk about whether a particular person is an anti-Semite or is uh, in some way uh, biased. And it's, it doesn't rest on any facts, it rests on the repetition of the defamation. And if you repeat, as Joseph Goebbels understood very well, if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes a kind of publicly accepted truth. And, and that's where the, uh, I think, uh, very destructive effect of this kind of tactics occurred. Mentioning just one incident uh, that is illustrative of a much broader pattern, the UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon uh, denounced me as uh, biased, even using the word as despicable, uh, with reference to opinions that had nothing to do with my role as special rapporteur but referred to uh, distortions of what I had said about 9-11 uh, uh, attacks and about the uh, 2013 uh, Boston Marathon bombing. After the first of these t attacks, I tried to find out uh, why a, uh, the Secretary General would launch such an attack uh, on someone within the organization uh, and I was told by his uh, aide-de-camp that they didn't, as he put it, do due diligence, which means they didn't read uh, what it was, what I supposedly said. And uh, besides, they were under pressure from the U.S. Congress to show that they were not anti-Israeli. And it was at a time when Ban Ki-moon was running for a second term as Secretary General. So one sees the insidious way in which these uh, political maneuvers uh, play out, and it's sort of reminiscent of the Soviet system where the leadership reaches out to some lowly individual like myself in order to uh, demonstrate a kind of larger uh, political reality. Uh, What I'm trying to explain by these references to my experience is the degree to which uh, these uh, quasi-NGOs stir up trouble uh, for those seeking to document allegations concerning Israel's violation and actually weaken uh, the way in which uh, the organization can function on behalf of the international community and the, uh, promoting uh, what I think uh, one would hope would be the global interests rather than merely succumbing to the national interests of the most powerful uh, members of the organization. And uh, one of the uh, uh, most disturbing uh, features of this is the degree to which the U.S. Um, ambassadors at the U.N. swallow what uh, U.N. Watch and uh, uh, NGO Monitor, both uh, kind of quasi-governmental organizations, what they uh, feed them. And uh, again, in my case, uh, Susan Rice and Samantha Power uh, both of whom uh, know better, uh, just routinely repeated the kind of uh, denunciations and defamations 
that, I, that were associated uh, with these attacks. Uh, the uh, second approach used uh, on behalf of Israel to weaken and discredit the UN involves uh, trying to both manipulate the organization and to undermine it at the same time. It, it's a very uh, sophisticated kind of uh, relationship to the UN uh, that Israel has. It, it both pretends to be victimized by the organization, and yet it, because of its uh, relationship to the US and its uh, clever uh, use of these kind of tactics, it intimidates the organization more than any other government, however large or small. It's a kind of a tour de force of a negative variety that it is able, despite being so uncooperative, uh, to be able to uh, impose its views. And the UN is, not, rather than being biased, it leans over backward in every particular context to make sure that uh, Israel's uh, best arguments are made uh, fully available and given uh, as much attention as possible. In other words, the reality is just the opposite of the uh, perception in this country. If anything, the organization could be criticized as being uh, 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 indifferent to the Palestinian uh, reality and uh, bias toward not offending Israel. It's, it's quite uh, an amazing uh, manipulation of uh, the reality, at least as uh, I experienced and understood it. Uh, and uh, there was a recent speech by the Israeli ambassador, uh, Ron uh, Prosser, uh, that uh, spoke of the U that the tide of hatred aimed at Israel within the UN. Uh, and uh, that kind of uh, language uh, is used to influence the atmosphere here in Washington and the Congress. And it's a sad commentary on the state of our democracy uh, that so many of our elected representatives swallow this central lie about the UN, an organization the world desperately needs to be strong and effective, uh, because of these kind of uh, defamatory uh, tactics. Uh, reflecting, uh, rather than the UN reflecting the supposed hostility of oppressive regimes to Israel, the UN has increasingly uh, been neutralized in any effort to produce a sustainable uh, peace uh, that is just for both peoples. One forgets that it is the UN that failed the Palestinian people uh, when the British uh, gave up their colonial mandate and dumped the future of Palestine into the hands of the UN. It's unlike any other place in the world as far as UN responsibility is concerned. And so, again, the criticism that, the, that Kerry makes, made and others that the UN devotes uh, uh, a disproportionate attention uh, to uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict is really the reverse of what it should be doing. And that is, it sh for uh, over 65 years, it's failed to realize the right of self-determination for the Palestinian people that every other major people in the world has enjoyed and achieved. And 
And it, it's, we, it's, it's, we have reached a time when we should expect and demand of not only the US government, but of the international community, uh, that it fulfills this long uh, neglected responsibility uh, and not uh, and not to uh, overlook the present realities of both peoples and the mistakes of the past, but to, to create some kind of future uh, that is viable for both peoples. My time is rapidly elapsing, more rapidly than my text, unfortunately. Uh, but let me just say the following, that Palestine may be winning the legitimacy war being waged throughout the world and at the United Nations to obtain popular support for the Palestinian cause with the peoples of the world. But it is continuing to lose the geopolitical war that is being waged within the organization. And it's very important to keep these two wars in mind. The, the, the legitimacy war is a war waged by people to achieve rights and justice. The geopolitical war is uh, being waged by powerful governmental forces linked to powerful economic forces that seek to, uh, to sustain unjust structures of authority and power. Let me stop there and thank you for your patience. Dr. Richard Falk, please. As a radio person, I'm not often conscious of the optics, and so I'll stand for my photo op. If you have questions, uh, there are cards. You probably have cards. You can write your questions on cards. And, and uh, if you hold them up, I will uh, circulate, or someone will circulate and pick them up. Our next speaker out of the photo op mode is a Boston-based physician and author and filmmaker and an activist. Um, Dr. Falk mentioned the defamatory tactics, and one defamatory tactic with which we're all familiar is labeling someone an anti-Semite. Another, which has not been used as often as it was maybe 20 years ago, is to label someone a self-hating Jew. Dr. Alice Rothschild is involved um, for, in the act Activities for Human Rights and Social Justice in the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. She's an active member of Jewish Voices for Peace, American Jews for a Just Peace, the Workmen's Circle Mideast Working Group, and um, she has been organizing health and human rights delegations to Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza since 2003. Please welcome Dr. Alice Rothschild. Thank you so much. I just got back from Gaza three days ago, if I'm a little verklempt, as we say. So um, first of all, I want to talk about what silencing looks like. Uh, it kind of overlaps with active muzzling, with a strict framing of the dominant paradigm. Um, it involves a widespread systemic intolerance of alternative framing. Silencing challenges free speech, rights of protest, it's all about power, about fear, and about the broad cultural and political assumptions in the world that we live. So I'm gonna first speak from my uh, personal experiences as a self-hating Jew, as you mentioned. Um, in 2004, I had come back from the region and I wanted to do Grand Rounds and I was invited to Cambridge Hospital to speak on the impact of war and occupation on civilians. And um, before my presentation, one of my colleagues came and leafleted the auditorium with these horrific pictures of Jews who'd been blown up by suicide bombers. And after my presentation, he got up and harangued me for 10 minutes, accusing me 
of lack of compassion for Jews. Um, I wanted to do uh, you know, a similar kind of uh, discussion uh, about healthcare and occupation in my own hospital. I was told by my department chief that I was, quote, a danger to the Jewish people. It took five years in his leaving and I kept trying to do my talk and finally they said yes. Uh, my talk was announced and they received 100 emails protesting my giving these grand rounds. And I would, had to take the word occupation outside of the title of my talk and I was told to stay away from politics. So fast forwarding the last year and a half, I've been doing a lot of book touring with my two books and my film and doing a lot of presentations. So I've been bumping up against a lot of muzzling. So in the academic setting, I was at American University and I was talking with students who found that they, if they focused on human rights, on opposition to occupation, supporting BDS, et cetera, they found themselves marginalized and accused of bias. They described a campus that was polarized with no conversation between the right and the left. Um, two professors had been uh, included in the list of professors who are dangerous to Israel, and one untendered, untenured faculty member talked about being warned to limit his comments, critical comments about Israel because it would endanger his future career. At John Carroll University at a political science class called Peacemaking in the Palestine-Israel Conflict, there were complaints from the local Hillel stating that Jewish students on campus did not, quote, feel safe, having me on campus, and I hit that a lot, that I make students feel unsafe. And they actually had a major meeting of the faculty to determine whether I could be allowed on campus, which I was. And uh, the most disturbing part of that um, little event was um, at the end, the Israeli shalicha, which is um, an ambassador that the Israeli government sends out to schools and temples and things like that to you know, do Israel messaging. And she basically came up to me in front of all the people and started screaming at me, attacking me as a liar, doing a great disservice to the Jewish people, and just being a general bully, which was kind of an interesting experience. At the uh, University of Maryland at an Arab media class, uh, one Jewish student told the professor after I spoke that he was very unhappy with my presentation, he was disappointed in the professor, he accused me of hate speech, and he said he felt offended as a member of Hillel. Um, at the University of Virginia at a book club, I was doing a book reading and several alumni complained and took it all the way to the president of the university that I should not be allowed to read from my book and then threatened to withhold funds since I was allowed. Um, when I've been in more religious institutions, there's a church in our DC suburbs that shares a building with a temple. They've had a long positive relationship and the rabbi told uh, the minister there that if he showed my film that he would sever their relationship. Um, there was a church in Vermont with a very uh, wonderful pastor who works a lot, does a lot of work with a progressive except Palestine rabbi who um, really pushed him hard when he invited me to the church and I saw the emails and the tone of the emails were, I'm profoundly disappointed in you, we've worked together for, on all, many, all these issues, I thought I could trust you and now you are showing this anti-Semitic one-sided film from this known self-hating Jew. Um, when I try to speak in temples, that's like getting up against the wall of McCarthyism. Uh, but I've had a couple of little uh, successes. Uh, there was a reform temple in Ithaca, which I found that whenever they have announcements about speakers like me, the person who does the newsletter puts a little disclaimer saying, this does not represent the um, opinions of the temple. Um, and I also found as I made my rounds of the few temples that would let me in is that their maps of Israel are all the greater Israel, including all the occupied territories. So that was sort of fascinating to find out. I was invited to an Orthodox synagogue in DC by an uh, Orthodox human rights lawyer who's also a Hebrew school teacher there. We set up the film and the rabbi canceled it. Um, at the Greater Jewish Community, I was in Sacramento. There's a Jewish Federation newspaper called Jewish Voice. Uh, for two times in a row, they've refused to publish an announcement that I'm in town, once doing a book reading, once showing my film, because they say that I am anti-Israel. In a Jewish community, in a public uh, library in uh, Ohio, I had this totally conflicted, agonized audience. They were completely unaware of the many millions of dollars that are being spent on Israeli Hasbara and the aggressive um, excuse me, control of Israel messaging. And one woman got up and she said, we could have this open conversation anywhere in the United States, but in Arab countries, we would be censored, arrested, and sold into sex slavery. 
I pointed out that actually I cannot have this conversation anywhere in the United States. In fact, I can't have this conversation in most temples, Hillel's, and Jewish community centers. She then pointed out that the poster for my talk was very offensive because it had the word conflict in it and a picture of the separation wall. So she said, it says what side you're on. Uh, the most disturbing point in this very interesting public library came at the end when a little old lady comes up to the poor woman who's selling my books and announced in a very loud voice that my book should be burned, at which point a gentleman standing behind her said, that's what they did in Nazi Germany. Um, and last February, <laughs> Last February, I was um, leaving New York City, and I saw this huge billboard, I don't know if you've seen it, that says, uh, New York Times against Israel, all rent, all slant, stop the bias. This is sponsored by the wonderfully well-funded and ironically misnamed Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting in America. So silencing can be both active, and it also comes through how we frame uh, the issues and the language, and what are the assumptions behind it. So going back to that uh, temple in Ithaca, um, the, one of the mahers in the Jewish community challenged me on my maps. And she basically said, you know, the Arabs were the migrants. And as she said, the last independent indigenous nation was 2,000 years ago. And she referred me to a right-wing blog for accurate information. Um, I was at World Fellowship in New Hampshire, which is a wonderful family camp for progressives, and a woman in the audience told me this amazing story. Her child was attending public school in the New York City school system, and they were studying indigenous peoples. And as an example, the teacher stated that the Jews were the indigenous people and the Palestinians were treating them badly. So the daughter, being her daughter, piped up and she said, no, 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 it's really you know, the other way around. And the girl was sent out of class to the principal's office. Her parents were called in and they were given a stern warning about that kind of talk. And when the mother agreed with the daughter, the principal actually said that that version of history is not allowed in the New York City school system. And just recently, I got this award from my town in Brookline for social justice work on Israel-Palestine. And uh, both of the elected officials in the Massachusetts legislature boycotted the event. They're usually presenting the awards. And one funder pulled out. So that's what you see in your community. If we look at the issue of framing and language, you know, the framing is the Jews are good, the Arabs are bad, and you think about the visuals. You know, in our newspapers, there's a tendency towards the sympathetic Jewish settler mother crying over her injured child and the young man wrapped in a keffiyeh throwing a rock. That's the two visuals you see. And so there's an emotional message in our uh, media that rarely portrays Palestinians as fellow human beings who may actually have some incredibly legitimate grievances and who actually are rarely rarely violent. So Palestinians are never seen as the most educated group in the Arab world. Who, they're never seen as the people with a long tradition of nonviolent resistance. You just don't see that. And so the question is, why is history that? Because history in our world is really a creation of groupthink. And if you go back in history, for decades, um, Palestinian history, trauma, aspirations, rights, have been really invisible in Western discourse. I think it's partly a reflection of our own racism towards Arabs, our Islamophobia, guilt about the Holocaust, and manipulation by Zionist leaders, and then we add in cultural, economic, and military imperialism. So how far does this go back? Well, there was early silencing of the Palestinian experience by US Zionists in the 1940s and the 1950s. So even back then, you would be viciously attacked if you criticized the partition plan, if you criticized Jewish nationalism and all that kind of stuff, or you mentioned that there was a Palestinian uh, tragedy. And so journalists were accused of anti-Semitism. They were threatened, politicians were threatened with loss of financial support. I mean, this goes way back to the founding of Israel. And then, as was mentioned, in 1974, the Anti-Defamation League uh, officially defined what they called the new anti-Semitism as criticism of Israel. And 10 years later, AIPAC issued this college guide um, exposing the, quote, anti-Israel campaign on campus, which they still think is going on, um, and basically was trying to tell students why they shouldn't listen to people who are critical of Israel because they're all obviously foreign terrorists and anti-Semitic. So you see this kind of McCarthyism crept into Jewish institutions, and the epithet of anti-Semitism has been used ever since to silence and demonize critical voices. Uh, the Israelis joined in the fray with the 
Herzliya conference in 2010, where they had a whole session on winning the battle of the narrative, and it's all about rebranding. It's a PR problem. And then a year later, the Route Institute in Tel Aviv, it's a think tank, issued a position paper laying out the strategy of, quote, naming and shaming those on the left who are critical of their of various things. And the important thing is that they um, identified a strategy to engage uh, Jewish institutions and individuals, to identify and marginalize groups, to separate medium-sized liberals from more critical liberals, and to create this Israeli brand. And you also see at that point the word, uh, the people, they go against people who are delegitimizing Israel. So that's another clue. Cl you know, word that comes up. So what's happening now is a direct result of those kinds of policy decisions. People talk about shielding Israel from the abuse of human rights law. And then in 2011, uh, Haaretz reported that there was actually an Israeli military intelligence unit that was created to monitor folks like us. So in academia, we have Hillel International, which is the umbrella organization for the Hillel chapters on American campuses. It did start out not as a Zionist organization, but it's basically become an Israel advocacy organization. And despite you know, um, espousing pluralism and tolerance, they actually have very strict guidelines about what you're allowed to talk about and what kind of speakers you're allowed to have. And in December of 2014, Hillel International and the Simon Wiesenthal Center developed a new campus surveillance surveillance tool, which is a phone app, to fight anti-Semitism, which will be deployed on 550 US campuses with Hillel centers. And it's supposed to report students and professors of, who are being anti-Semitic, and they call it See It and Report It. Um, the Anti-Defamation League uh, last December also published a list, a blacklist of uh, those who have linked what's going on in Ferguson with what's going on in Palestine. And also, as was mentioned, there have been more than 6,000 US police trained in Israeli police and military units, and this is funded by the ADL. It's also funded by JINZA, which is another group to watch, the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs. And you may not know that the New York City Police Department now has a branch in Tel Aviv. So we now have our police emulating the Israeli Defense Forces. We have academics being monitored and attacked. We have university donors pressuring administrators. We have groups sympathetic to Palestinians being confronted with lies. And I suggest you um, Google Hamas on campus. It's a really interesting YouTube. And um, then people are emotionally blacklisted and you know, called anti-Semitic. Now, in the Jewish community, there's actually a tremendous conflict because Jews have traditionally been more left-wing on every other right but Palestine. Um, and many of us, particularly people under 35, which obviously doesn't include me, feel that we are being asked to suspend our love of justice, democracy, and fighting for the oppressed when it comes to Israel-Palestine. And we see very right-wing forces, Campus Watch, Stand With Us, Camera, APAC, David Project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, aligned with the Christian right, lobbying Congress to support the most right-wing governments in Israel. I call this our own US branch of the Likud. And then we have muzzling of dissent and tolerance in our own community. So these assumptions are um, reinforced. Um, you know, The Jews are the good people, Arabs are the bad people. Jews are like us. They're white people creating a Western-style state in a savage, untamed region of the world. So after 67, there was this move towards making uncritical support of Israel the cornerstone of being a good Jew. And so being a Jew and a Zionist are now merged, and Israel is the religion. Christian Zionists marched up and embraced the idea we all got to return so we can have an apocalypse, so they embraced the settler movement. Liberal Christians then bought the mythology. The US government developed our huge military industrial complex. And with this framing, the history and trauma and aspirations of Palestinians becomes more and more invisible. So this manipulation happens by controlling the message. And how is that done? We have birthright trips, which are basically brainwashing. We have students that have been recruited, and I've heard paid, to use uh, social media to uh, compliment Israel. They call this public diplomacy. There are a ton of free junkets for all kinds of people, ranging from academics to food and wine critics, to go to Israel. Um, we have all the academic collaborations. We have our uh, Israeli ambassadors in all sorts of Jewish settings, enforcing what the message is. And so there is this multi-million dollar industry to brand Israel with pinkwashing, greenwashing, um, faithwashing, all those kind of things. 
The good news is that there is pushback. There is a lot of pushback towards greenwashing and pinkwashing and faithwashing. And if you don't know what it is, just ask me. And there's also pushback within the Jewish community. Um, we are not monolithic. More than 50% of Jews in America, particularly those under 35, have no interest in Israel or feel some sympathy for Palestinians. And the interesting thing for me as a, you know, confirmed secular Jew is that many groups are questioning all of this framing using Jewish values and doing it in the name of Jewish religion. So I have young uh, students telling me Zionism has hijacked Judaism. And we keep mentioning Jewish Voice for Peace. This is an example of, of the growth of one of those kinds of groups. We tripled in size during the Gaza war. Um, a group called If Not Now came out during the Gaza War demanding that Jewish communal organizations recognize the Gaza dead. We have the Open Hillel Movement, which is demanding that Hillels um, do not uh, monitor and have these red lines, and these kids are having these conferences, breaking all the rules, talking about BDS in Hillels, and it actually did happen uh, just in February at Harvard. Um, three civil rights leaders from the 60s got up and talked about BDS at Harvard Hillel, and we all were are very happy. The other thing that you're seeing is what, what I call an increase in intersectionality, so that there are unified coalitions forming between students of color, um, Muslim students from colonized countries, queer and trans students, feminists, all seeing the links between the oppressions of Palestinians and their own oppressions. So in conclusion, because I'm going to get this in 15, 18 minutes, um, what is happening to Jews and their allies is a loud battle about the meaning and understanding of history. We're separating Judaism, the religion, from Zionism, the national political movement. We are making a call to define a Jew as someone grounded in religion or culture or history, a set of ethics, a sense of peoplehood, and all these definitions are equally compelling. It does not matter if you're in the diaspora, you know, because Israeli Jews think us diaspora Jews are not really first-rate Jews. And so diaspora Jews are really reclaiming our legitimacy and our voice as Jews. There's a delineation of the racist ideology of anti-Semitism from thoughtful moral criticism of the policies of the country of Israel, and the treatment and solidarity of Palestinians has now become the civil rights movement of our day. We see major challenges um, such as the boycott divestment sanction movement, the campus uh, open Hillel, Students for Justice in Palestine, et cetera. We have African-American civil rights leaders embracing this issue and drawing parallels with our civil rights struggles. And with all of the increased amount of information that we ha now have access to, you really can't hide reality anymore. And I would like to propose that the intensity of the backlash and the muzzling may also reflect that the mainstream and right-wing forces are feeling increasingly cornered. Their positions are less defensible, and perhaps this is the beginning of a major turning point in the long struggle for justice in Israel-Palestine. Thank you. Dr. Alice Rothschild, the civil rights movement of our day, she defines what we are witnessing. A generation ago, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said again, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The final speaker on this panel is an acclaimed author and media critic. Uh, he's a filmmaker who's Writings illustrate that the damaging racial and ethnic stereotypes of Arabs, blacks, and others injure innocent people. Dr. Jack Shaheen is a distinguished visiting scholar at New York University. He served as a CBS News consultant, how do you ever get that job, on Middle East affairs, <laughs> and as a professional film consultant. Please welcome Dr. Jack Shaheen. Uh, Richard Goebbels would probably use the Arab proverb, by repetition, even a donkey learns, uh, to initiate his propaganda. And Alice, um, Israeli, Jew equal good, uh, Arab, Muslim equal evil, is the subject of my brief comments this morning. I want to thank you. Let me start with another Arab proverb. 
One hand alone does not clap. And I'm very humbled and honored to be here with my Jewish and Israeli colleagues uh, who receive criticism from both sides. Uh, and I think it's real, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's just good to be together to kind of work towards peace and to bring people together. Um, one more quote, Sophocles, I'll paraphrase Sophocles. Those who tell the stories rule society. And Jack Valente, Washington, former president of the Motion Picture Association of America. Washington and Hollywood spring from the same DNA. Yeah, so I, you know, and, and finally, the last quote, my wife loves it when I use quotes, so uh, you have to either blame her or credit her, all right? It is, while I was walking in the hall, I saw this terrific photograph of my hero when I was a young man teaching documentary film, Edward R. Murrow. And Murrow's great quote, though, What we do not see is as important, if not more important, than what we do see. And I sincerely hope someone would send that message to C-SPAN, <laughs> because they're not here today. <laughs> uh, I, wanted, I wanted to talk about uh, a little, and, 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 and believe me, there are wonderful Israeli filmmakers that do not do what the Israeli filmmakers I'm talking about today do. I, I want to start with a uh, gold, Menachem Golden and Yoram Globus, uh, who in the 1980s bought a motion picture company called Canon Films. And they churned out dozens of films that vilified Arabs and Muslims. And no one really wrote about this or discussed this. And the only person to bring it to light was my friend Arthur Lord, who's since passed on, a Jewish American who worked for NBC News. And he did a special for NBC on the Today Show and received just hundreds of hate mails. But I thought, you know, to get things started, liven it up, would show a quick clip of some Golan and Globus films, plus a few others. And then I'll move on to television and we'll wrap it up. So can we show the glow, Golan Globus? Another way we can look at the connection between politics and entertainment, Washington and Hollywood, is the manner in which historically cinema has projected the Palestinian people. Since the founding of the State of Israel in 1948, our support has never wavered. Every American administration has made it clear whose side we're on. In contrast, Washington's policymakers have failed to support the millions of Palestinians who have been made refugees and who have lived lives of poverty and squalor as a result, while policies impact opinions. So equally unjust is how Hollywood has presented the conflict. Movies repeatedly depict Palestinians as terrorists, making it seem that all Palestinians are evil. Made in America, Colonel. Now that image has been perpetuated by Hollywood films, beginning with the film Exodus. It dealt with the very early conflict. Here, Palestinians are either invisible or they're linked with Nazis, perpetrators of horrific acts. The 1966 movie, Cast the Giant Shadow, is another early film presenting Israelis as innocent victims of Palestinian violence. Kirk Douglas is an American military specialist and he goes to assist the Israelis. Some of the dialogue in this film reads like it came straight from the public relations department of the Israeli government. Now here's a country surrounded by five Arab nations ready to shove them into the Mediterranean. No guns, no tanks, no friends, nothing. People fighting with their bare hands for a little piece of desert. The Palestinians in this movie are the lowest of the low. We see them solely as vicious gunmen, wide-eyed maniacs. They will kill anyone, anywhere, anytime, for any reason. There's one brutal image in particular. 
of a burnt-out bus with a dead Jewish woman tied to its side, with the Star of David carved into her back. And when the Palestinians finally speak, they mock and psychologically terrorize another woman trapped in a bus. Well, if we jump forward a decade to the film Black Sunday, the Palestinian terrorist is now a woman. Striking where it hurts them most, where they feel most at home. She flies the Goodyear blimp into a Miami stadium and tries to wipe out 80,000 Americans at the Super Bowl. She cold-bloodedly eliminates anyone in her path. The movies that we see basically follow Washington's policy. It's reflected in the cinema over and over again, particularly during the 1980s and the 90s, where you had perhaps 30 films which showed Palestinians as, um, as a people who were intent on injuring all Americans. How may we help you, Jad? One of the most despicable portrayals of Arabs and Palestinians occurs in the 1987 film Death Before Dishonor. First, they murder a guard and then slaughter an Israeli family. They kidnap and torture an American Marine, and in cold blood, execute another. And they burn the American flag right in front of the American embassy, and then dispatch a suicide bomber to blow it up. One reason we've not been allowed to empathize with any Palestinian uh, on, on, on the silver screen is, is due to two Israeli producers, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus. These two filmmakers created an American company called Canon, and they release in a period of 20 years at least 30 films which vilify all things Arab, particularly Palestinians. They even came out with a film called Hell Squad showing Vegas showgirls trouncing Arabs in the middle of the desert. I mean, the, the, the Vegas showgirls, I think, uh, is, is a good way to wrap up the Golden Globus film. Uh, you know, these were, of course, aimed at uh, teenagers. They're all B-minus films but very, very successful movies. There are a couple of myths that American filmmakers, television producers, as well as some Israelis uh, perpetuated. One was a land without a people, uh, that, that there are no Palestinians. Uh, two, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And three, the only Palestinians that exist uh, are terrorists. Now, if we fast forward to today, and this really disturbs me. Well, let's go back to 1996. Uh, 1996 was the first real Israeli introduction uh, to American television. And that's when CBS TV introduced Ziva David, who was a Mossad agent to a very successful series called NCIS. Not only did David wear a Star of David, she also wore an IDF uniform to show the military influence on her character. Harvard University professor Etienne Kensky identified David as, quote, the most prominent televisual Israeli in the United States. Her depiction was praised for exposing the Western public to Israeli society and culture, its positive portrayal of an Israeli, and its cheerleading role in promoting the ties between the United States and Israel. Now here she is working with American agents, not only killing Arabs and Arab American and Muslim American terrorists here,
but throughout the world, even in Israel. There's one episode where she goes to Israel and, and kills some of the most ugly Palestinians. I, I can't watch it again. I mean, I, I, I watch so many TV shows and films, but, but this one took the cake. Anyway, that, that show lasted for nine years. Now, can you imagine, there was no press on this, if two filmmakers called Hishmi and Hunedi created Canon Films, and vilified Jews and Israelis the way Golan and Glob Globus vilified Arabs and Palestinians, what the press might have been like. And, and why didn't the producer of NCIS include a Palestinian heroine working with NCIS? You know, call her Leila Rafidi. So Leila and Nada, they could have done the Dubki and the Hora all at the same time. But no, 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 we have to have this biased point of view over and over again. I've been talking about this issue for more than four decades now. I gave my first speech at the American University in April of 1975. And what I keep trying to hammer home gently, very gently, is entertainment acts as propaganda. We don't see it as propaganda. We think it's mere fluff. The films of Leni Reifenstahl in Nazi Germany were more effective the Germans' propaganda films. So we cannot look at these films in a vacuum and think, you know, it's, they're, they're pure fluff. If we fast forward to today, there are two Israeli producers, Avi Nir and Gideon Raff, responsible for some of the most horrific anti-Arab shows I've seen in my life. Tyrant, Dig, and Homeland. Homeland, you know, it's sort of like 24 for grown-ups. I understand the Israeli version is much better than this one. If you haven't seen Tyrant, don't. It's, it's been renewed for another season. It's all about this mythical Arab country where Arabs kill Arabs, slaughter Arabs. The one brother, you know, seduces women while the family watches, even rapes his daughter-in-law. Dig is set in Jerusalem. You'd never know there were Arabs in Jerusalem at all. They, they don't appear, except last week, they did appear. They attacked the car, you know, with one of our diplomats, beat up our diplomat and the Israeli driver. That's the only time in four episodes I've seen a Palestinian, except for one guy called Khalid, who runs from place to place. And if you see the movie Dig, and not Dig, yeah, it's the Brad Pitt movie. I'm sorry. Um, it, again, in that film, they say, um, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It's World War Z. I don't know if you've seen World War Z or not. But, but that, again, is a, is a theme that's repeated over and over again. So there has been no press on this Israeli presence and how they portray Arabs on American television, these two producers. And they convey a very hard line, a very biased perspective of how Arabs are perceived, how we think of Arabs. Last night before going to bed, I flicked on the TV channel because I couldn't sleep, and I was watching The Blacklist. And there's a key player in The Blacklist, a Mossad agent, who wiped out some Iranian terrorists. <laughs> you know, and so this, what we talked about earlier today, what my distinguished panelists have brought about in terms of a presence of government Government, our government working with Israelis, holds true as well in the entertainment industry. So let me conclude. I need my glasses for this because I wrote it down and I can't remember it. So here we go. I want to conclude on an optimistic note. Joseph Lowry, a humble man, champion of civil rights. Uh, this was at President Barack Hussein Obama's inauguration. It reminds us that those who have vilified Arabs and Muslims in the past have the ability to eliminate them. They just need to embrace the wisdom of Lowry. Quote, Lord, help us to make choices on the side of love, not hate, on the side of inclusion, not exclusion, tolerance, not intolerance, and help us work for that day when black will not be asked to get in the back, when brown can stick around, when yellow will be mellow, when the red man can get ahead, man, I, and I added this phrase, and when the Israeli and Arab man get it right and see the light and refuse to fight. 
I began with those who tell the stories rule society. When we begin to tell the stories, American and Israeli filmmakers, when we begin to tell stories, now more than ever before, fresh new stories, stories that shatter stereotypes, stories that humanize the people, stories that conquer fear, stories that create new ways of seeing, new ways of thinking and feeling. When we create those stories, we will crush hate and advance peace and sort of remind ourselves that all humankind is truly one family in the care of God. Thank you very much. That again was Dr. Jack Shaheen, uh, who provided us the uh, Las Vegas review. Thank you. Uh, time for questions. And um, we have uh, uh, many questions. Uh, why don't we start uh, here, and um, we'll expend our time with uh, Dr. Rothschild. Or should I do all of them? And uh, one why don't you do a couple, and okay. then we'll go. Dr. Falk has uh, many questions directed to him. And uh, I think I have one question also for okay. Uh, Dr. Shaheen, but we'll start with Dr. Alice Rothschild. So, okay, so I'm going to address a couple of questions. I just want to say on the issue of the um, oh, action. Me. Let me interrupt. I'm sorry. sorry. I apologize. I had a note. I left it. Please remind, be reminded that Jack Shaheen will be signing his book after this panel at 1145, and um, that's uh, a commercial from our sponsor. I'm sorry. That's okay. And I'm signing my book at 105, no commercial, though. Um, so I, I just wanted to add to that um, the uh, action film called Dig, which is filmed in East Jerusalem. Um, there were over 20 uh, Palestinian uh, civil group, society activist uh, groups that protested the filming of the film in East Jerusalem. And what people don't know is that the Israeli government and Jerusalem municipality gave the film people $6.2 million grant to make that film. So this is also Israeli propaganda, Hasbara, stuff going on, but that wasn't the question. So the first question is what is anti-Semitism, which is a fabulous question, and um, how does it relate to Zionism? So let me give you the two minute answer to something that people write PhD theses on. Um, the way I define anti-Semitism is hating Jews because they are Jews, and that that's, that's the, only re the, the main reason to hate them or the organization they're in or whatever. So how does Zionism mesh with being Jewish? So if you look historically at Zionism for you know, a billion years, there was sort of a religious Zionism, the Zionism of my Orthodox grandfather. It was a messianic sometime, some, you know, who knows when the Messiah will come. And it was that kind of religious, mythical Zionism. It wasn't actually meant to, that something would actually happen in the near future. And then um, in the uh, late 1800s with Herzl and the first Zionist Congress, there was an increasing uh, movement amongst uh, Eastern European intellectuals um, to respond to the horrific amount of Christian anti-Semitism that occurred in Europe. And they, along with all sorts of other groups that were having movements of nationalism, so it's in that context of nationalism, and also in the context of colonialism, uh, developed the idea that the Jews needed an actual place to go to be safe. Um, they were kind of vaguely helped by the British Empire that promised the same piece of land to the Arabs and the Jews. Um, and I think one of the things to remember is that Lord Balfour, with the Balfour Declaration, had Christian Zionist tendencies. So there were a lot of sort of anti-Semitic reasons why colonial powers wanted to get rid of their Jews and put them someplace else. Um, there was actually a tremendous debate within uh, the Jewish intellectual community. Uh, I put Martin Buber on one side and Herzl on the other. You know, uh, should there be an actual place? Should it be in Uganda? Should it be in Palestine? Should it be a binational state? Should it be a Jewish-only state? I mean, this was a major, major debate, and I think it's important to understand that. Um, the people who wanted a Jewish-only state won out, and sort of the rest is history. So at this point, when I use the word Zionism, I'm referring to a political Zionism as it is currently practiced. 
And the way I define it as currently practiced is a belief that Jews, for either historical, Holocaust, biblical, whatever reasons, um, deserve or must have a state that is for Jews and that privileges Jewish people over everybody else. And um, that that is what's going on in uh, Israel right now and in the occupied territories. So um, the reason that I think it is really important to separate Jews from Zionists is that, first of all, many Jews are not Zionists. Zionism is a political movement that I think, in retrospect, has had really catastrophic implications, both to non-Jews and to Jews. And I would argue that political Zionism, as it is now practiced, is incredibly dangerous to Jews. So that creating, you know, when I look at the state of Israel and I look at the policies of the state of Israel, I can't find anything Jewish about it except singing Hatikva in Hebrew. I mean, seriously. And when I, you know, I'm at a checkpoint and there's some 20-year-old pointing a big gun at me, and you know, accusing all the civilian Palestinian women that I'm surrounded by of something, this is not Jewish. This is not Jewish values. It is not Jewish history. It's just not related to any of my understanding of what it means to be a Jew. So I put that under Zionism and under political Zionism and under occupation and under oppressing some other peoples because they're not Jewish. And even in the state of Israel, 20% of the citizens are Palestinians and they are second class citizens. They get less of everything. And so for me, um, founding a state that by definition privileges Jews over everybody else is doomed a, to ca chronic catastrophe and ultimately to failure. And I think that's very different than Jews as a religion or an ethnicity or as a culture. So that's why I keep those very, very separate. <laughs> Uh, I thank you for a um, series of questions uh, which I cannot do justice to, but let me um, at least uh, address one that I think is uh, raises a very important question, and uh, the question asks, Israel has ignored with impunity numerous UN resolutions. Why has there been no uh, effort in the General Assembly uh, to decertify Israel from the UN. In effect, uh, there is no constitutional veto in the General Assembly, and the great majority of governments in the world are highly critical of Israel. But what I think one doesn't understand, and I probably didn't make clear enough in my uh, remarks is that in addition to the constitutional veto that exists within the UN Charter and the way in which the structure of the UN is set up, there has emerged a geopolitical veto which uh, paralyzes the organization at the level of implementation. See, the, U the UN General Assembly can say what it wants. It can declare things. It can uh, propose fact-finding uh, inquiries into the attacks on Gaza of the sort that the Goldstone reported, but it's incapable of implementing the recommendations that follow from those initiatives or of uh, enforcing or uh, achieving compliance with its resolutions. And that's because the UN was created with the idea that it is an instrument of statecraft, not an alternative to it. And it's very important, the UN is very important symbolically and in waging this struggle to control the heights of international law and morality, which mobilize people. There wouldn't be a BDS movement or an anti-apartheid campaign if there hadn't been a UN to create a consensus that what Israel is doing and what South Africa was doing were uh, violation, fundamental violations not only of international law, but of the most basic ideas of international morality. 
and constitute, in effect, crimes against humanity. But that a consciousness, see, the UN is important for mobilizing a moral consciousness around the world, but it's incapable due to its structure and due to the way in which world order is organized on a global basis to create the behavioral uh, changes that that moral consciousness calls for. That depends on civil society. And there is this growing realization, I think, that governments are not going to solve this problem and that the UN cannot solve this problem that it will depend on the mobilization of people. And that's why, in my view, uh, these, uh, the, the growing global solidarity movement and the organizations like uh, Jewish Voices for Peace and the BDS campaign are so important at this stage of the struggle. Okay, so I'm being asked, what is the New York Police Department doing in Israel? And there are no blacks there to kill except the Ethiopian Jews. <laughs> so first of all, that's not quite correct. Um, there are Sudanese and Eritrean asylum seekers who are black who are subjected to horrific amount of racism. So there are blacks to kill. But uh, that's not the answer. So the thing that you need to understand is that what um, sort of the Israeli PR is, is that one of their biggest products is security. And that they really know how to do crowd control. I mean, they've been occupying a whole ton of people for decades now. And so they have the expertise to do crowd control and to fight terrorism. And when you sort of investigate this a little bit, not only do they have the most advanced weaponry, mostly from us, but they have developed a huge system of collaborators and sort of um, a malicious kind of security system to keep a population under control. So what our American cities want to do is to learn how to control us. They want to learn how to control protests and crowds. They want to learn how to fight, quote, terrorism, as it is getting more and more broadly defined. And Israel is supposed to have the best product. So that's what our policemen are doing in Israel. The other thing that is very, very um, worrisome, I think, is, for instance, if you look at the wall between the US and Mexico, uh, that is partly built by an Israeli company because they're also really good at building walls to keep people out or in or whatever they're doing. So, um, and the thing that gets even more messy about this whole thing is that um, our US military now has all this excess equipment now that we're not actively killing a whole bunch of people, we're just kind of doing it more slowly. So the military is now giving our police departments tanks and you know things you might need to do if you're doing traffic in Idaho or something. So we have a police that are weaponized by our excess military equipment that are trained in Israel and that means that we are all at risk. So I always like to remind people that this is not some you know, little conflict off in some crazy country. This is gonna to come to bite us. The reason that we have our Fergusons and all the black men that are just assassinated, shoot to kill, is for a reason. And these are the kind of forces uh, that go into making that uh, true in our society. We have uh, lights, red lights are flashing. Tones are beeping. It is time for us to take a break. Uh, as uh, much as we might want to hear more, uh, it is time for us to take a break. And I think we should stick with our discipline and uh, carry on as the previous panel did and not be a bad example for those who have yet to speak. So please uh, take a break. Uh, Dr. Falk will be signing books in 10 minutes. And um, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad you're here. <laughs>